How many of you have meditated on the title or the term lost and found? If you stop to think about it, it's very optimistic because you've got lost and then you've got a little connecting link and you've got found so that there's always a hope or there's always, according to lost and, and found, what is lost can be found. So lost and found, in a way, is, is a term that's too black and white because you can be a little lost and a little found. And what I'm talking about, we go back to Lost and Found, my book. It came out originally in 1979. And those days were very different from today. But 1979 was a seminal year because the, the 1960s had already happened and there was a fallout from the 1960s and it shook everybody up and it woke everybody up and it started waking up adoptees because adoptees were, according to a term that I used, in the great sleep. And we can talk about the great sleep later. But some of us woke up and looked around and said like, who am I and where's my mother? And asked all kinds of questions that we never dared to ask before. Okay, I had that challenge because there was more openness or there is more openness in adoption practice White adoptable babies are very scarce. The birth mothers, therefore, have power, which they didn't have before, because they can choose who's going to adopt their baby. And there's now international adoption, which there was some then, but not like it is today. And people are adopting out of, they're adopting foster care kids. So a lot of people came up to me, you know, adopted parents and professionals, and they said, well, things are so different now our kids aren't going to experience what you adoptees did because my book, Lost and Found, is called Lost and Found, The Adoption Experience. And my answer to that is, yes, there's a difference in adoption practice, but adoptees still feel identity issues, loss, grief, guilt, and they're still trailed by ghosts. When you see an adoptee, if you really want to see an adoptee, you have to see their ghosts. My ghosts are here with me, and your ghosts are all here. This room is filled with ghosts. To one side is the ghost of the child that I might have been if my birth mother had kept me. And on the other side is the child my adoptive parents might have had. And that child is a very idealized, wonderful child. And that child is a sibling of my ghost and in competition. And some adoptees in that situation will try to compete with the ghost of the birth parents. Some of them will drop out. Another ghost is the ghost of the birth mother, who's always there behind her, just very faded as the birth father and the grandparents and siblings ancestors, but mainly the birth of the ghost mother. And this ghost mother is an idealized mother. She's a very powerful figure, because even though the adoptee has ambivalent feelings about her, after all, she is the one who abandoned him or her, the adoptee still needs that birth mother and so holds on to the idealized version of her. Grows up with her, that adoptee is always accompanied by her. And I've had adopted parents say to me that they're going to go abroad to adopt because then they don't have to worry about the birth mother coming around and knocking at the door. And I tell them that the ghost mother has arrived on the plane with their child. And they should remember that. She's still very much a presence and she's very important to them. They have to understand that. These ghosts are in a place that I call the ghost kingdom. And the ghost kingdom is not on a map. It's a, it's a psychic territory. And it's a place where the adoptees visit their lost parents. So that when you notice an adoptee daydreaming and seeming to be lost in fantasy, they're in the ghost kingdom.